Hi, everybody. We are beginning with Laws of the Soul, webinar commentary number three, uh, page 89. I'd like to backtrack just a little bit because I realized when I had that trouble, I pressed the recording button but didn't look carefully enough and didn't take. This is where I left off. Um, let's see if we can interpret or define the true significance of this law, which is in reality, the expression of a divine impulse, okay, it's coming from above and not below, leading to a defined activity, a focused, Saturnian, specific piece of work with its consequent and subsequent results and effects. It was this aspect of sacrifice which led to the creation of the worlds or to the manifestation of the divine creator here we can speak of a planetary logos or a solar logos. And in general, except maybe, well, we really, you know, can't know anything about the reappearance of the universe <laughs> endless, endlessly. Um, but we may know something about local creators such as our planetary logos or systemically our solar logos. And it seems that the reincarnational theme uh, for uh, the, the theme of re-embodiment is undertaken for the sake of sacrifice, for the sake of lifting, uplifting those who were left behind in the previous final synthesis. Short of the universal pralaya, it seems to me that there will always be certain forms of life, certain groupings of energies, certain units of consciousness, which are not absorbed because not fit into the final synthesis. And the rebirth is undertaken for their sake. It's obvious in the case of the human being that there are all manner of arrangements within the um, permanent atoms, within the karmic content of the permanent atoms, which express imperfection, uh, disharmony, uh, incorrect relationship. And reincarnation is undertaken to, in the human stage, to raise their level of vibration. Now that is where we had come to when um, there was a failure <laughs> to record and then we went into the significance of the law of sacrifice and went into the idea of the impulse of giving and there I did in fact discuss with relative fullness the meanings. Forgiveness and Atonement or at one moment, these are the keys of the Christian faith, and in a way, it is a very high faith when understood in terms of the second aspect of divinity and not the sixth, because after all, it is aligned with the uh, principal ray uh, emerging into manifestation on our planet, the second ray, and also the soul ray of the solar logos, and maybe at length, and finally, it will be the um, even the monadic ray of our solar logos. As I've said, uh, although that monadic ray may be the fourth, this is hypothesized by the astrologer Stephen Pugh, and I think he has something, there's something to be said about that for it. Uh, if it's the fourth, fifth, sixth, or seventh, any monadic ray cannot remain as such, but must be resolved into one, two, or three, and that fits with our solar logos as well, and as it is a, uh, a heart center within a cosmic logos, the chances are that the resolution on the monadic level will be onto the second ray. Unconquerability. Okay. Now we can go on. Ponderously, I realize um, he certainly did blast this idea of the damnable doctrine of the elect. <laughs> uh, 
and the idea that through simply an emotional choice one might be saved, whereas all others would be damned. Uh, expressing the incredible uh, dualistic spell which hovers over the consciousness of humanity. So let us, uh, we're entering into number three here. And um, the meaning of sacrifice and death come into the rightful place in the human consciousness and the law of giving with all that it entails, the law of giving. Uh, I think we can say that there is no elevation without giving. Uh, uh, there is no elevation and no release without, without giving. Okay, so we go on. Th those who thus sacrifice are the solar deity who gave his life to the universe. Notice this. This tells us so importantly uh, how the word universe is used. Um, so this is not... Um, to the planet, to the solar system, etc. I want to put that as one of our understanding uh, little references. Uh, universe means solar system. And as usual, this has to be in UK English or it doesn't work. Universe means solar system. And this is uh, Esoteric Psychology 2, page 89. We have to be careful, so careful about our usual understanding of the term universe, which means the uh, grand entirety of cosmos. So universe means solar system. Okay. Right. So let's continue. The solar deity, we presume that to be the solar logos, who gave his life to the universe, um, our, local, our local system. Maybe it even means galaxy, but I think it's much more local. To the solar system, to the planet, and the manifested worlds consequently appeared. So the manifested worlds of our system, that's what we're speaking of of our solar system and not um, okay and not of all manifested uh, worlds the cosmic deity whoever that is whatever that is has done likewise done the same likewise done the same but what does this mean to us even to the Tibetan even to the masters really so even to the masters, what does it mean? Not except a symbol. Well, are we talking about the cosmic logos here, or are we actually talking about the deity of the entirety of cosmos? If so, then indeed we are simply dealing with a symbol, really something that we understand to be taking place according to the law of analogy. It was his impulse, his will, his desire, using the personal pronoun in the masculine sense, only for want of something better, his incentive, his idea, and his purpose to appear. The creative act then took place, and the process of manifestation began its cyclic evolutionary existence. Hard to believe that he's talking about the the uh, highest uh, logos, the universal logos. I call it the universal logos. When I use the uni term universe to indicate the grand entirety. The cosmic Christ was crucified upon the cross of matter and by that great sacrifice opportunity was offered to all evolving lives in all kingdoms of nature and in all created worlds. You know, it uh, to me, this sounds as if we are still within the confines of the one about whom naught may be said. 
who is our local cosmic deity or super cosmic, well, I sometimes call the being in whom our solar logos is a chakra as a cosmic logos and the one in whom the cosmic logos is a chakra as the super cosmic logos or as DK tells us, the unknown, Cosmic Fire 293. Thus, uh, for the sake of those who were where they were when the last cosmic pralaya came in, when I say cosmic, I mean locally cosmic, they could be lifted further by the crucifixion of the cosmic Christ. Um, so let's just say that uh, that crucifixion uh, offered opportunity to all who had reached only a certain point of development uh, when the last pertinent prolia, uh, well, the last pertinent prolia was activated. Okay. Thus they could progress the work in space and time and the stupendous march of living beings towards an at present unrealized goal began. Well, we have, even with respect to the solar logos and the beings entailed within the further reaches of his existence, an unrealized goal. We know maybe a little something about it. We even have an unrealized planetary goal. We certainly have an unrealized goal for the cosmic logos of whom our sun is a heart center and certainly an unrealized goal within that great cosmic entity that we know or call at least the one about whom naught may be said. What is the goal? Human beings cannot realize it and we do wonder to what extent the masters realize it as well. We can give no reason for the choice made by deity thus to act. Mm, thus to create the worlds, let us say. Uh, thus to create the worlds, except that the law of sacrifice is operative. We do not know his ultimate purpose or plan, even of the solar logos. We do not, and if, as the name of our planetary logos is not fully known, even by the masters, his ultimate purpose can only be known in a general way. So we do not know his ultimate purpose or plan, and only aspects of his technique and method begin to appear to the illuminated mind, and we might say, and this after the third initiation, and only dimly. It has been hinted by those who know so much more than we, and maybe DK is speaking relatively here, owing to their longer life cycle and experience, that some glimmering of the eternal and cosmic intent is beginning to dawn in the consciousness of those who have taken some of the higher initiation. So in this case, Master D.K. is speaking of that of which he himself is not certain. Because uh, the glimmer only begins to appear in uh, higher initiates than he is. So what will be the destiny of our solar logos? I think that's what we're talking about primarily here and maybe of how did it start here. Uh, the solar deity who gave his life to the universe, to the solar system, to the planet, and the manifested worlds con uh, consequently appeared. So we're talking about some local Logoi, of whom our solar logos is one, and he is a cosmic being. Their nature must necessarily remain incomprehensible to mankind. All that intelligent humanity can grasp as he looks back over the history of the planet, as far as modern history can give it to him, and let us say, uh, and the uh, history as given in the secret doctrine uh, in... Well, is that there has been 
um, progress in the human power to be conscious. We realize that we are somewhat more sensitive, so it seems, than some of the average types of the previous root races. A growing and paralleling refinement of the forms of life in the various kingdoms of nature. I guess we can, well, we can wonder about the mineral kingdom. Maybe we don't know so much about that, but maybe radioactivity was not present in the way it is now. And the escape of the mineral monad through some transitional form into the next kingdom was not possible in those earlier days. When we un look at some of the fossils of the plant kingdoms, we realize that indeed there is a greater refinement in that kingdom, and it's certainly when we look at the stupendous but rather crude forms of the animals of ancient times, we sense there has been refinement. And uh, so it has been, I believe, with mankind generally. We we cannot speak of the guides of the race who incarnated in those forms because they had an altogether different psyche. So as we look back over our history, and certainly the secret doctrine is the, as far as I'm concerned, the unparalleled history book of the development of humanity, there is um, the power to be conscious that is uh, increasing. The refinement is increasing, and an intensification of conscious activity on a developing scale of rapid living that tends constantly to transcend time as we know it. He always, or most often, he includes a disclaimer. <laughs> time as we know it. Time as it is known on the lower planes. Time, In other words, that somehow, in some sense, there is in higher beings a sense of time which is pertinent to their stage of consciousness, but it is not the same sense of time as we have, time as we know it, very limited by the sense of constant sequences of perceptions. So intensification of conscious activity, uh, the tendency to transcend time and to be less the prisoner of time, right? To be less the prisoner of time and to not uh, and um, not to be subject to time as such a limitation as heretofore. And then what else? An expanding realization of progress from one dimension to another until today we talk uh, in terms of a fourth dimensional state of consciousness and can grasp the fact that five or six dimensions are beautifully possible. Well, uh, this means one thing to the mathematicians and physicists, and another to the occultist uh, who speaks of dimensions, well, who speaks of uh, planes as dimensions. So the fifth and sixth dimension are, in this case, those of the atmic and um, monadic planes, and the fourth dimensional state is particularly that of the plane of harmony or booty or of uh, rational unity. I'm remembering him using that fascinating phrase to describe the consciousness of the buddhic plane, the plane of rational unity. So there's also an expanding realization of progress from one dimension to another. This is if we um, look back over history and compare where humanity was at former times to where it is now. We have growing power to be conscious, growing refinement, growing ability to transcend time, um, progress from one dimension to another, and an increasingly scientific control of the elements in which we live 
and of the forces of nature. Of course, the Atlanteans had that too, but that knowledge was uh, uh, retracted or removed from their uh, memory, and in time, the ways of control were forgotten. Today we talk in terms of air mastery, just as 500 years ago, when such a thing was deemed impossible, they talked in terms of the mastery of the oceans. So mastery, control of the elements, this is another way in which we have improved, but obviously he's not considering the Atlantean times because there was, with their so-called uh, airships or vimanas, as they were called, a mastery of the air. But we're talking about relatively modern times. We are offsetting the gravitational pull of the Earth so that we can fly into the face of the sun and we might say reach the soul uh, dimension. So uh, we are not speaking here of Atlantean Vimanas. HPB in her secret doctrine discusses the use of these um, flying machines and how they were the possession of the highly advanced types in the Atlantean periods, including the sorcerers and uh, those who were reinforcing the value of form and matter. And from the instinctual life of sense consciousness in material forms, we have progressed to the intellectual life of self-conscious human beings and to the intuitive realization of those who are beginning to function as superhuman entities. Maybe we should, you know, list these. This has been the progress of man. And uh, let's just say power to be conscious, refinement, and power to transcend time. So, um, right. Power to be conscious. Um, power to transcend time. And I skipped one there. Growing refinement. And progress from one dimension to another. Um, whoa, okay. So, um, here we have it. Uh, growing refinement. And then number four, it would be progress uh, from one dimension to another. And then uh, number five, uh, control and mastery, and uh, mastery of the elements in which we habitually live, and then from instinct to um, intellectual and uh, dawning intuitional life. Okay. This has been the progress that we have succeeded in historically uh, over our long evolutionary period. And uh, those in Atlantis who had these, they were of the advanced type. They were not the true Atlantean. They were there for largely for purposes of service, or they may have been initiates of a previous solar system who were there to more to prey upon and use the relatively emotional humanity of the period. So all this, all this progress has been brought about as a result of the determined, conditioned activity of a great life. Um, so let's see, uh, our progress is the will of a great life in whom in whom we live and move and have our being. Aha, uh -huh. imagine that, it actually printed out. A great life in whom we live and move and have our being. 
which chose to make a major sacrifice and to be crucified upon the cardinal cross of the heavens and therefore passed through a cosmic initiation. And we, we speak here um, um, of Sanakumara. Of Sanakumara, or really uh, of our planetary logos, of whom Sanakumara seems to be an emanated extension focused in certain worlds, a, a kind of incarnation of our planetary logos. I think he has many incarnations. I think, in a way, uh, every planetary scheme is a kind of incarnation of our planetary logos. But we particularly deal with Sanakumara and his relationship to the humanity of our globe and of our chain. It is an extension uh, of himself by our planetary logos in a very focal and redemptive way, and we call this extension Sanat Kumara. So a great life, um, all of our progress, it's not our own, it's uh, driven forward by a great being who has a certain pl uh, will, a certain purpose, will, plan, to which we at first involuntarily respond and eventually respond in a conscious and cooperative manner. Well, uh, I've done it again. <laughs> I failed to uh, start my recording of my time. This must be some strange day. Well, now it is recording, but uh, I think we've been going, you know, maybe for 20 minutes here. I'd have to make an estimation. So all this has been brought about as a result of the determined, conditioned activity of a great life, which chose to make a major sacrifice and to be crucified upon the cardinal cross of the heavens, indeed, uh, upon which uh, our uh, planetary logos, Sanakumara, is crucified. Now, our solar, our planetary logos is taking a cosmic initiation and is lined up once he masters his um, cosmic astral vehicle to take the second cosmic initiation. Obviously, uh, the logos of Venus has already taken that particular initiation pass through a cosmic initiation and uh, which from our minor and relatively uninformed angle stands today crucified upon the fixed cross in the heavens. Uh, let's see if I can conditioned, conditioned activity of a great life. Well, okay, it is a sentence which continues, and um, this is about this great life, which, from our minor and relatively uninformed angle, uh, stands crucified upon the fixed cross in the heavens, and through the medium of the mutable cross is nevertheless producing changes in the evolutionary cycle, um, the fixed cross of the soul and the uh, mutable cross of matter form, increasing refinement of form and that intensification of life which distinguishes his creation. I think D.K. is telling us that uh, we do not know much about the cardinal cross, uh, nor can we assess the activities which occur upon it. But at least um, from our angle, this great life is influencing our soul development and our evolutionary cycle. Is working in that way. So we have a quite a, a, an uninformed um, idea of his particular work, even though he is really crucified upon the cosmic, uh, the cardinal. How far that cross extends? Well, um, it must be an operative idea 
Let's see. Um, the cardinal cross must be an operative idea um, within the boundaries of the one about whom. Uh, in whom the z zodiac of signs, uh, signs of the zodiac um, are portions of his heart in head center in the head okay heart in the head center yeah that's it so there will be other zodiacs in other cosmic systems but our particular zodiac with its um, cardinal fixed immutable crosses at least apply within the boundaries of the one about whom not may be said in whom our zodiac of constellations play the role of the twelve petals in the heart and the head center of the one about whom naught may be said. Okay. So, a study of those expressed objectives, presumably at this time, of our planetary logos, in whom we live and move and have our being is a development of consciousness, a refining of forms, an intensified intensification of realized life. So we have here second aspect of divinity, the refining of forms, third aspect of divinity, an intensification of realized life, first aspect of divinity. Interesting how it is that the consciousness uh, development is listed as the first objective, giving the sort of second aspect bias of our planet and also of our solar system. The refinement of forms through which consciousness can function, because the more refined the forms, the uh, greater and more sensitive the consciousness and an intensification of realized life, well, equivalent to the opening of the uh, central fire, the influence of the central fire and of the jewel and the lotus, the, the central core of each entity, the central chakra, just as we have uh, in each chakra a central jewel, so there is in each living being, who is, after all, a chakra, a center, central uh, living fire, which under some circumstances can be called uh, a jewel. So a study of those expressed objectives will convey to the earnest student a meager understanding of the lowest aspect of divine purpose. Meager. <laughs> okay, it's basically um, light, love, and power. That's one way to put it. It's conscious sensitivity, refinement of forms, and the penetration of the life aspect into the consciousness and into the form so that it may be realized by the consciousnesses which are still immersed within form. The wonder of the idea, certainly to a consciousness like Master DK's, staggers the human imagination he might have just said staggers the imagination, but he knows uh, there are imaginations which are not staggered. <laughs> so these are great, wide-reaching objectives of great creators undertaking incarnation for redemptive purposes and thereby confining themselves, thereby limiting themselves to certain ring past knot, which otherwise they might easily transcend. But uh, whenever sacrifice is involved, there's a limitation of scope, a temporary limitation of scope. So when, when conscious sacrifice takes place, there is a conscious limitation of scope 
for the sacrificing entity. In other words, contacts which otherwise might be made, fresh impulses which might be registered and assimilated, these are temporarily. It's interesting how Saturn is the Lord of Time and the Lord of Sacrifice, both. Saturn is the Lord of Time and of Confining Sacrifice. So for a time and in a confined space, for a limited time and in and within a limited space, sacrifice occurs. So many of us would like to have certain contacts to help us grow and relate to a larger context, but we find ourselves perforce confined for a certain time, to a certain space, to a certain duty or activity, a certain function. We can't, we can't uh, fulfill all functions simultaneously, and the correct fulfillment of any function represents the sacrifice in as much as we cannot be fulfilling other and higher functions simultaneously. So time and space are involved in the idea of sacrifice. And the great sacrifice, our planetary logo, says Sanat Kumara, has limited, limited himself to a very small space, our particular globe, uh, for a certain duration, uh, perhaps until the judgment day, and beginning, I think, well, can we say beginning at individualization of man, but maybe beginning earlier, in fact. It's a span of some millions of years in order to elevate the lives on this particular planet more rapidly than otherwise might be the case. And so this voluntary confinement to reduced opportunity is sacrificial. And we rebel against it, really, because the spirit wants everything and is everything. Voluntary confinement for a period of time in which reduced opportunity is experienced is sacrifice. There are probably many definitions of what I would suggest is that each of us determine certain definitions which are most impressive to our method of thinking. We have to define sacrifice for ourselves because we have to pass through it. And I think whenever we have the opportunity for exposure to Jupiterian enhancements which will make the consciousness grow and the sense of self would expand, and yet are faced with our duty, our function. A post, no, a post is a implanted locus. We must remain at our post, at our spot, at our point, and forego many spiritual incentives offered in this multidimensional universe then we feel what sacrifice is. It's the difference between remaining fixed at a point and uh, with, with limited possibilities of contact and contrasting that with expanding into a much greater field where all kinds of the new uh, contacts are possible. So, in another sense, we could say that uh, sacrifice is a deferral of the new. Same old thing. We have to go over and over these recurrent types of duties, but we can refine our approach to them, refine our skill in action, and strangely enough, Saturn, who keeps us fixed at our post, 
is also called the planet of opportunity because we build our abilities and therefore can progress all the faster and with greater certainty while we are in possession of these reliable uh, abilities built by repetitive action while standing at our post. So he shall stand until the last weary pilgrim finds his way home, at least among the pilgrims who are within the range of his redemptive intention. So if this is a statement of fact, and that we can get some meager understanding by thinking of the of divine purpose, by thinking of consciousness, refinement, and life, the intensification of realized life. It has to be conscious, of course. So that if this is a statement of fact, and if these ideas are about the expression of still deeper and more beautiful cosmic purposes, remember that all the laws on Sirius we don't know. <laughs> And of which, uh, of which our three cosmic laws are simply uh, lower expressions. May not the goal be realized as being far beyond human computation? Bringing in the mathematicians and the astrologers here with their computations, when its lowest expression embraces the highest intuitive and abstract concepts of which the most elevated human consciousness is capable, I commend this thought to your deep consideration. And there will be then the sense of relativity. You know, what is it really? Um, that a man can accomplish or can perceive. There are limitations, and the lowest of the purposes are the highest of our possible achievements. And he's talking about the most elevated human consciousness. Does he include the masters? Because masters, in a way, are still human beings. So he's giving us a sense of perspective here. There are still deeper and more beautiful cosmic purposes, and on and on it will go as we move into an understanding of the galaxy in which we are playing our part. Greater and greater um, cosmic purposes will appear within the context of this galaxy and beyond. So. Really, there is a chain of hierarchy, and we are being upheld by those who know and see so much more, just as we are upholding those who need to see what we can see. We have to understand our limitations, and of course, when speaking of limitations, it fits very well with the study of the law of sacrifice. Uh, the law of sacrifice... Uh, through temporary limitation, or th uh, let's say through voluntary submission to temporary limitation, brings about rapid advancement once the limitation is lived through. So those who are in the midst of sacrifice seem to be retarded in their progress, but when released from the sacrifice and given the benefit of all they have learned, they make very rapid progress. We might look at the life of the Christ as much as we can understand of it, which is really very little, which has been a huge demonstration of sacrifice, and we have to remember that the Christ is the most rapidly evolving of all the earth humanity. So, Sacrifice is related to rapid evolution. The Christ, uh, who is the great example of sacrificial living, 
is also the most rapidly evolving human being uh, amongst Earth humanity. So it gives one pause, doesn't it? And we sometimes look at the labor in Gemini of Hercules. He had to stop. He was on his way to get those golden apples, you know. But here is Prometheus crying out in pain, and so he apparently stops his progress to free Prometheus, who is a symbol of the solar angels, so they can return to their place. And then he's on his way to the Golden Apples when he sees Atlas, who may be the symbol of the spiritual hierarchy upholding the burden of the world. And he stops his apparent progress in order to help Atlas bear the burden of the world. And lo and behold, the Golden Apples fall into his hand. Um coincident to that uh, sacrifice. So Master Moria's words, when have you ever become less through sacrifice? It's really something to ponder when we are in the midst of submitting to confined conditions which apparently offer little scope for the kinds of growth we towards which we might aspire, towards which we yearn. But if we fulfill our Saturn in this respect, then the great advantages offered in, the tra in a trans-Saturnian trans world will be ours the more rapidly. The, the way to slow oneself down, surely, is through selfishness. It will be apparent, therefore, why it is the energy of the fourth ray which is related to the law of sacrifice and who in this fourth planetary scheme and in our fourth globe, and, and who is it, or is it why, why, so I, I think this must be why, not who, I think, and why in this fourth planetary scheme and in our fourth globe, the earth globe, so much emphasis is laid upon the law of sacrifice, the law of those who choose to die. Hmm. Well, is it apparent to us why this is the case? Perhaps the relinquishing of the lower in the attempt to harmonize with and respond to the higher of the pairs of opposites? maybe we will understand something of the struggle of sacrifice. Um, certainly the fourth ray uh, depicts the struggle of the one who sacrifices torn between what is desired and the call of duty to remain at one's apparently limiting post. Okay, we'll see if we can be clearer about why it should be obvious that the law of sacrifice is ruled by the fourth ray fourth ray of conflict, conflict with a view to eventual harmony is at present not one of the manifesting rays, so we might say that um, fourth ray souls uh, are out of incarnation, yet in the light of the larger cycle, this ray is a major controlling factor in our earth evolution, well even this larger cycle even this larger cycle, a perhaps 44,000 year cycle of which about 40,000 years remain. 
And since we're dealing with our fourth uh, globe and uh, fourth chain and this planetary scheme, which is fourth from the sun, and dealing with the fourth kingdom of nature and the fourth creative hierarchy, um, and this law of sacrifice is so important to the monads, the lords of ceaseless and persevering devotion, we can see the relationship uh, of the fourth ray to all the kinds of circumstances in which we are involved and in durations that are longer than this 40,000 plus year cycle because humanity has been under the influence of the fourth ray for millions of years. So yet in the light of the larger cycle, this ray is a major controlling factor in our Earth evolution, because we remember the symbol of Earth is the cross uh, enclosed in the circle. And right now, of course, I think we experience it largely as the cross, but the enclosure, the synthesis, the way that the competing energies and polarities come together in a circle has yet to be completely demonstrated. So this ray is a major controlling factor in our Earth and in the evolution of our solar system, which is one of the fourth order uh, and is an astral... Uh, okay, astral... astral buddhic solar system. And we have a, a very strong Devic, Buddhic presence in our solar system, much stronger than that of the presence of those monads who are the monads of men. Okay, so the realization of this may indicate why our little planet, the Earth, is of such apparent importance in the solar system. And we can say that so many fours come together and emphasize our uh, planet as a place where solar systemic conflict is being resolved gradually. So just as our planetary logos has a great battle through uh, upon our globe and within our chain, the solar logos is undergoing on his own and higher turn of the spiral, a battle within our planetary scheme. All of this intending to bring about a condition of harmonization, which as yet eludes us. And so um, we submit to the conflict of detaching ourselves from a lower pole and attaching to a higher in order that we and all may progress. So uh, sacrifice is accompanied by conflict, hence the fourth ray. As important in relation to this law. So, um, the realization of this may indicate why our little planet, the Earth, is of such apparent importance in our solar system. Well, we're in the middle of a great struggle and we are preoccupied by the struggle and perhaps to higher type of vision. There would be some importance to what's going on on the earth with respect to our solar logos, but not the kind of overwhelming importance we attach to it because we are so close and so embroiled in the conflict. It is not simply because we choose to think so and thus feed our own arrogance, but it is so primarily because the fourth ray of conflict and this first law are in time and space dominating factors in the fourth kingdom, in nature, 
the human kingdom. In other words, how can uh, we become graduates of our uh, planetary hmm, process and adjudicators between the pairs of opposites if we do not struggle between them. So we're learning something about the poles and counterpoles of the pairs of opposites, about the second aspect and the third, about the present solar system and the previous one, about our particular chain and the previous or moon chain. We are torn between material and spiritual tendencies, which is the life of the fourth ray. Torn between material and spiritual tendencies, the life of the fourth ray. Our planet, the fourth in a series of divine, in the series of divine expression with which we are associated, the fourth major one anyway from the sun, has a peculiar relation to the position of our solar system in the series of solar systems which constitute the body of expression of the one about whom not may be said. Well, we have to be careful here. Um, we are fourth, and our uh, solar logos uh, expresses through a system which is a heart center in the cosmic logos. Uh, in the cosmic, C-S-L. Okay. C-S. Logos. So the fours line up, um, the, the heart center is the fourth center, just as our earth is fourth from the sun. So our planet, the fourth in a series of divine expression expressions with which we are associated, has a peculiar relation to the position of our solar system in the series of solar systems which constitute the expression of the one about whom not may be said, uh, the body of expression. Well, um, we have to see, are we speaking of a cosmic logos or of a super cosmic logos? Our the system of our local cosmic logos may well be, I've been hypothesizing a solar plexus center within the one about whom not may be said, but within the cosmic logos, our sun is in the position of a fourth uh, entity, a heart center. So you sometimes wonder about the destiny of the earth and its second ray, whether it might one day fulfill a more second-ray function than presently it is. The functions remain the same, and the different entities move through them, just like, let's say, the office of president remains the same, and the different entities move through that office, rising as they become qualified. He does really emphasize here the fourth ray of conflict and he says, with the intention of achieving harmony, but he really puts the conflict first. So, the thought of conflict is emphasized first. It must never be forgotten that this fourth ray of conflict is the ray whose energies, rightly applied and understood, bring about harmony and at one moment, this is the goal. Okay. And we're told about the higher aspects of the fourth ray being those of harmony. And the lower aspects of the fourth ray being those of conflict. Is there sacrifice without conflict? It is um, uh, to sacrifice, let's put it like this. Um, to sacrifice, I sacrifice <laughs> is to place 
oneself in an inescapably conflicted situation. Because one is going against, one is opposing uh, a natural pull towards that which is lower and maintaining a um, painful point of tension in resistance to the lower pulls. Of course, the higher pulls help maintain that point of tension. So eventually, the harmonizing will come about. The result of this harmonizing activity is beauty. Okay, uh, that which is uh, naturally attractive uh, and magnetic, drawing the entity towards itself. But it is a beauty that is achieved through struggle. That is the fourth ray. Um, without struggle, the beauty has to be earned through struggle as the fourth ray achieves beauty. There's also the second ray um, type uh, of achievement of beauty, but we're told of the second ray that it agonizes towards the goal. So struggle and agony, they are found in both of these middle rays, the fourth and the second. So uh, without struggle, no harmonious beauty. And the creative ar artist, I think, uh, contends, let us say, with many forces within his nature which are dissonant in order to arrange them in such a manner that uh, har harmony and beauty may be the result. So this produces a livingness through death. Uh, dissonance must die. And lesser relationships must give way, fade out. A harmony through strife that we're familiar with, and a union through diversity and the adversity of the diverse. Whenever you're attempting to bring together many and diverse energies, some of them will be adverse to each other, and one has to find the right arrangement which will allow them to adjust to each other and fall into harmonious relationships. So in some ways this is the uh, ray of mutual adjustment leading to harmonious relationship. There is an engagement where the conflicts are worked out and common ground is found and the dissonant elements are de-emphasized and a new type of cooperative relationship is based upon points held in common. There's always going to be something the two entities share and upon that sharing they can build. So what have we been speaking of here? The fourth ray of conflict will bring harmony. Now, we have a very conflicted global situation at the moment, but it has been the history of humanity, the fourth kingdom, to progress through great strife and through the death of the form. We can say um, livingness through death. The form is killed in conflict but the consciousness becomes more exquisitely alive through the sacrifice of the form, through conflict. So the first ray and the fourth ray are intimately related, and this has a lot to do with the fourth plane, which interestingly enough is the first plane of livingness, the fourth, uh, fourth plane 
is the first plane of cosmic livingness and is also called the mountain whereon form dies. So death gives place to livingness. Death of the form gives place to livingness. I think the struggling creator understands this. Many things have to die in order for a truly living product to emerge. So this is the ray of uh, livingness through death, of harmony through strife, and of union through diversity and adversity. Okay, so three additional names of the ray of, uh, of harmony through conflict. The sacrifice of the solar angels brought the fourth kingdom of nature into being. So they divided their presence and their consciousness, thus creating a point of tension. They still had work to do on their own high plane, and D.K. warned us not always to be, oppor to be importuning our angel and leave it free to do what it must do also. But it extended itself, a fragment of itself, into what became our vehicle, the, the heart center of the descending monad, and thus had to endure the tension of being within a foreign land, within us, and within itself simultaneously. There was this rending process. You know, sacrifice always involves... Um, counterpoles. Usually between something higher and something lower. So the, the solar angels had their own high state achieved, and yet they submitted themselves to a lower level of vibration and certainly to a great confinement over millions of years. Maybe not as long as the confinement endured by Sanat Kumara, but still a substantial confinement. Some of them from the very first, maybe 21 million years so far, others submitting themselves to confinement when the moon chain humanity came into the earth chain in the third uh, sub-race of the fourth root race, and thus involving some, I don't know, 10 million years perhaps, it's a long time to be divided in two. It's a long time to have a lower sphere of obligation while still attempting, as one can, to pursue one's ongoing elevatory objectives. And yet, the work with the human being is, actually, after all, part of the growth of the solar angel. That is why they are not purely avataric, descending to a lower space with no benefit to themselves. The returning nirvanis, as they are called in esoteric liturgy, literature, with um, deliberation and full understanding, took human bodies in order to raise those lower forms of life nearer the goal. Well, uh, this is literal in a sense. Uh, some of them literally took human bodies as their vehicle and were entirely present within those, what's it called, huge tabernacles of clay and uh, ill-favored at that. <laughs> In other words, not the most beautiful type of presentation as we consider beauty presently. So some of them took human bodies in order to raise those lower forms of life nearer to the goal. Others simply implanted the spark of mind. Others, in a more detached manner, fanned the flame of mentality. 
And so the human being could emerge slowly into the human stage. There are a number of different ways of engagement uh, by the solar angels with humanity. Uh, so in order to raise those lower forms of life nearer to the goal, these were in our ourselves. Now I assume he means by that these lower forms or the being consciousness within those forms were ourselves. Well, DK is speaking identificatorily here. Obviously, he's not a part of Earth humanity. He's much more moon chain humanity, though not apparently first solar system humanity. Someplace he seems to say that because he talks about those of the first solar system being much different than we are. So these lower forms of life who were in a way the monad embodied in animal man were and are ourselves at least earth humanity. Um, right, okay, let's put this down. So at least um, Earth humanity, though not the other types of humanity, although DK is identifying here. He's a master of wisdom. He's on the path of Earth service. He is identifying closely that great power of identification, which is the capability of those upon that first path. The lords of knowledge and compassion and of ceaseless perse persevering devotion, who are ourselves chose to die that lesser lives might live. So as monads, we too were subject to the law of sacrifice. As monads, we also subjected ourselves to the law of sacrifice, and thus our pilgrimage. It's a different kind of sacrifice than that to which the solar angels subjected themselves. They are monads too, but they are monads uh, of greater attainment in their expression upon the cosmic physical plane, and maybe on other planes as well, because they have been too serious, apparently, to be trained as solar angels. So the lords of knowledge and compassion and of ceaseless persevering devotion who are ourselves chose to die in order that others might live. And right there, here is the key to the meaning of the esoteric name. Okay, so um, this is the meaning of the esoteric name of this law, the law of those who choose to die. So choose to divide, to descend, to be in two places at the same time, <laughs> and thus, sorry, be torn. Well, we, we know, you know, just as one flame, one great flame lights a series of lesser flames and yet remains, the monad stays at home even as it goes forth. That's a sacrifice. That's a division. The monad mm, stays at home, the monadic plane, even as it goes forth as the monad in extension, we can call it. The monad in immersion in the five lower worlds. So wherever you have the deliberate assumption of a bipolar state, the maintaining of two contrasting poles simultaneously, you have sacrifice. Okay. Right. Maintaining of two contrasting poles 
simultaneously. So it's so sacrifice in a way. I'm coming up with various ways of looking at it. Sacrifice, in a way, is a condition uh, of division and of the tension rising from that division. I think we can understand that. The monads go forth into the lower worlds. It is a sacrifice. They have higher possibilities, but they confine themselves into uh, a type of imprisonment in matter form. The solar angels do the same. They have many pursuits on higher planes. They could be making, but an aspect of their nature is confined. Isn't it interesting? It's always an aspect of the nature that is confined and not the entirety. This is important. Um, an aspect of the nature is confined, but not the entirety. And when we human beings sacrifice, this is also true. We maintain our higher consciousness in the midst of apparent confinement. So, you know, we can be doing something very mundane and apparently limiting, but where is our consciousness? We can also be achieving in higher ways, even while attending to the lower, apparently lower, necessity. Thus it is for the solar angels who still pursue their own type of spiritual telepathy on higher planes. Thus it is for the monad who has his own work on the high monadic plane and yet is extended into a confinement and... Um, material immersion. And this sacrifice has made possible the evolution of the indwelling consciousness of deity. So, the willingness to self-divide and endure the tension of self-division is sacrifice, and this is clearly uh, related to the fourth ray, which uh, specializes in two-ness, which have to become a oneness. This consciousness, having worked its way through the subhuman kingdoms in nature, needed the activity of the solar angels. And this is really, you know, this consciousness our consciousness, is really monadic consciousness uh, in extension or emanation. But in order to make the bridge and to make it more rapidly at least, um, the solar angels uh, were called in with the awakening of the planetary heart center. So having worked its way through the subhuman kingdoms, this consciousness of the monad and extension needed the activity of the solar angels to make further progress possible, uh, and we might say in a timely manner. And so herein lies uh, our service to God through sacrifice and death, uh, helping his... Uh, wholeness, achieve liberation sooner, our service to other souls through deliberate self-sacrificing purpose, so we can find, it's always confinement, we can find an aspect of ourselves to do the things which other souls need done, but which we do not necessarily need done, because for us they have been done, 
and our service to other forms of life in other kingdoms. And you do see, actually, human beings, uh, uh, a number of human beings work with the lower kingdoms. They cannot build their uh, spiritual faculties uh, through well, maybe I shouldn't say that. Maybe they can. But let's just say that the normal, the normal method of building their spiritual faculties through higher contacts is foregone. But still, there can be much spiritual building through compassion and uh, through love and the will to see the lower rise. I think, you know, the solar angels are building in this way. We are very primitive beings compared to the solar angels, but as we rise, there is some gratification and benefit to them, and when we work with the lower kingdoms, it is so. And when we work with our fellow human beings who may be on a slightly lower rung of the ladder, uh, in such a way that we can help them take the next step on the ladder, then we also benefit because uh, we can say that um, sacrifice opens the heart center, which is the fourth center. So um, the contacts may be reduced, uh, but love is deepened. And the sense of unity with those left behind is strengthened. And the cohesion of the whole is promoted. And this is so uh, if we follow the word group, which we ran into earlier, you know, group consciousness, group benefit, group advancement, all of these things having to do with the word group. Well, time is an interesting thing. I <laughs> what I must do now is end this particular program. Not at all sure of how long it has lasted because I failed to press my timer. But this is the end of um, uh, Laws of the Soul webinar, commentaries number three, EP2, and, well, we're on page 93, I guess, looks like it, page 93, and we will begin with Laws of the Soul webinar, commentaries, page 93, and which one will it be? It will be number four. So I, I might have gone on and done a two-hour program, except it's too risky given the uncertain timing. So we are deeply into the question of sacrifice and what it is and why the fourth ray is related to it. Uh, always we have our own consciousness, whatever it is, but whenever we extend a part of our consciousness, a part of our presence, a part of our being into some lower dimension and their attempt using our own higher attainments to lift uh, the lives who are confined to that lower dimension, we are undergoing the tension of sacrifice. Interestingly, Sanat Kumara is called sometimes the fourth Kumara, and it does identify him somewhat with this fourth ray, and with the necessity to maintain the point of tension at his sacrificial post. The higher life pulls, but the lower demand attracts his redemptive attention, and he stands at the point of tension between. And I wanted to say that, that the, um, the sacrificing life stands steadfastly, that's the word for the fourth ray, at a point of tension between 
the higher attractions acting upon his spirit soul and the lower demand of the lives which he can help by investing his presence in their in the locale of their confinement. There's no reason for Sanat Kumara other than the redemptive reason to confine himself to our particular globe in such a focal manner, but he endures that kind of self-division in order to assist. The sense of time has changed entirely for him and he knows there is no real time. He's able to uh, defer his own spiritual gratifications. And we can say that uh, in order for us to sacrifice there must be a willingness for us to defer our own spiritual gratifications. And the uh, altered sense of time as unreal assists with this. <clears throat> we will never run out of time. In any particular context, we might, but in terms of, uh, well... Are the, the universal process and the super universal process. We live in eternal duration. And so time, well, in, in that sense, is the one thing that will always be with us, cyclically appearing. <clears throat> and we will never be told, ah, you can't do that because you've run out of time, not in any final and ultimate sense. All things intending to be done will be done. And in a strange sense, within the absolute, however you can say, you can't really use those words, all things forever that could be done have been done. Well, that's a big mystery, I think, and one that we could ponder when we consider the perfection of deity. All right. I have exactly one hour here on the um, audio part. However, a good 20 minutes was spent before that. So we'll go on to number four shortly, and we'll see you then.